If it's going to, if I would gladly spend 30 grand if I'm going to make back that money many times over, over the course of a year or two. And it blew her mind. The woman who was the business owner was like, what, 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 what? The Career Challenges Podcast, a collection of stories about overcoming professional hurdles and learning lessons the hard way. Thank you for joining me. I'm your host, Kai Workerly, Certified Ghostwriter. So I have with me on this episode, David Summerfleck, and David is a digital marketing specialist, and not just a digital marketing specialist, but you have reached that rare uh, position to where you are semi-retired. Is that right? Yeah. Semi-retired. So my question is, why not go all the way retired? Why just semi-retired? Because retirement sucks and it's boring, but (laughs) to also to, if I may, to shed a little bit more um, a little bit more light on on the introduction. I I'm I'm, I'm not saying this. I don't think it's a, I don't think it's helpful to brag so much. But I do think that if you are a professional service provider mm-hmm. and you take pride in what you do, I think it is important for the public and, and the people you work with to know that you have experience, that you have a background. Um, you know, and, and the, it's just like I told you when we spoke on, on my podcast, you know, tell people what it is that you do and how long you've been doing it. Because if you don't, they don't know. Mm-hmm. And it's the only way to inform people. So basically, I have about 20 years. I stop at 20 because I just basically stopped counting at 20. <laughs> but I have at least 20 years experience working in digital marketing for multiple uh marketing and advertising agencies and publishers. I also worked in freelancing for several years off and on. I started my own agency with my wife. I also started a mediation nonprofit organization. Um, So I have all that experience in digital marketing. And I realized that, you know, in the process of doing all of that, You can't do that and sit in a cave somewhere. So, I mean, I had to interact with many, many different types of business owners, entrepreneurs, uh, CEOs, people from all different types of companies, uh, nonprofit organizations, startups, and, and many, many, many small businesses around the country, around the world. So, you know... I would say I'm a digital marketing specialist because I'm proud of that. And it's, it is what I do. Um, but I also have a background in marketing for managers. So it's really project management, working mm-hmm. with businesses on restructuring how they do things and how digital marketing and web-based tools can help them make more money, consolidate overhead, work more efficiently, get more done more quickly, and just run a more lean, mean machine and better support their own families, which is really what this is all about. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And you had mentioned earlier in the, just in our recording that you also are a podcast host. Yes. Yeah. I, I have a podcast called blue Monday. Um, cause blue is my favorite color. And, um, that's, you know, just part of what I do. I have like 20 pairs of blue glasses because I, I did a website and I shouldn't say I did a website. I worked with an optician, uh, quite some years ago and they, they were what you would call a mom and pop. Mm-hmm. They were an older couple in their seventies and they're still around today and they needed we base, I used to go there basically to get my glasses. And finally, one day, one of the owners said, hey, do you know anything about this web stuff, about digital marketing? And I said, yes, I do. What do you need help with? So they told me, well, we, we tried doing it for free. We tried Wix and Weebly and Squarespace and Vistaprint, on and on and on. We tried it for years and just never could get anything that looked decent. If people looked up Optician locally in Google, they could never find us the same old story that you hear over and over again, could you help? And I said, of course I can help. The question is, are you going to let me do the work? Or are you going to stand in my way and try to micromanage? Are you going to let me do what you know I can do? And they already knew me well enough 
to know that I was not somebody to play games and, and fiddle faddle around all the time. I was, that's how I talk. And I just say, you know, look, I, I love you. You're a great guy. You know, everybody loves you and on and on. I can do this for you, but you've got to let me do it. You can't have me put, you know, say I've got to put a million pictures of your puppies up here and all this nonsense. Mm. You got to let me do it. So I created a beautiful custom site for them. that has got award-winning design. Um, they're number one at Google for optician in their city and state. Um, I showed them how they could bid on government contracts and win using their website. All they have to do is copy and paste the content that's already there on their website, and they could bid on government contracts with the Veterans Administration and win these contracts. And if they only get one contract per year, they're going to triple whatever they paid me many times over every year. And they've already done that. And I showed them how to use Dropbox and some other tools to consolidate overhead, to put all their receipts and all their bookkeeping online so they'd never have to worry about losing anything ever again. I showed them how they could automate the bookkeeping and the receipt process and, you know, how to have an automated phone thing so people could call it 24 hours a day and get their messages and retrieve their messages mm -hmm. and stop losing customers. So part of that deal, other than the five grand, was I want you to give me at least five grand worth of glasses <laughs> um, because you can. And I think it's a good deal yeah. uh, because it, we also do regular, you know, we did a lot of maintenance work. We did a lot of other work there in the store to help them get their shop up in more uh, streamlined as well. So part of that deal was the glasses. So I have about 10 pairs of blue glasses. My wife has about three or four pairs of purple. And one day she just said, you know, you're kind of a sloppy guy. Why don't you got all these blue glasses? Why don't you just wear blue all the time? At least <laughs> then you'll look color coordinated and it'll make it easy for you. There it's you easy go. for you. You'll stand out. And you got all the blue glasses and you can just, Hey, you're DMS blue. And I'm like, you know what? You're right. So I have like three blue smartphones. I've got about 20 blue t-shirts, 20 blue dress shirts, two or three blue suits. I don't have a blue walking stick yet. And I don't have a blue top hat yet, but, or blue cowboy boots, but those, those will be coming soon. Wow. wow. And I, I like do like blue skulls. Oh, blue skulls. So, okay. Yeah. I'd like to see that someday, the whole blue yeah. get up. <laughs> that would be awesome. Yeah. And I just tell everybody I'm DMS blue. Those are my initials. It's what I do. And mm. it's my favorite color. So I'm a digital marketing specialist who provides digital marketing services or digital marketing success. And I work with business owners who are serious and committed to growing. If they're not serious and committed to growing, don't talk to me. Because mm -hmm. you, you're wasting both our time. True, true. So you you worked with big agencies. You worked on your own. You also mentioned uh, on the other podcast you worked for for Score, helping small businesses yeah. as a coach there. Yeah, yeah. I was a certified. And, and let me explain too. If you volunteer for Score, it's not like a walk in the park or something where you just sign a paper and it's done. Yeah. And what is what is Score again? I don't remember what in the world it stands for, um, but SCORE is basically, it's a service organization for retired executives. So I was a project manager and a digital marketing specialist, um, team lead for several different agencies, and I started my own. Um, and basically I went to them when, when my, my wife and I kind of retired, and we bought the house and we're doing okay. And I went to score and basically, you know, offered to volunteer. And you do have to go through quite a bit of training um, and orientation. And I became a certified business mentor. Um, and and, and I, I'd have to say for like the six first six months or so, I don't think anybody was keeping track of what I was doing. Um, you know, I thought, well, look, I'm volunteering for you. I'm talking to all these business owners who are coming out of the woodwork asking about digital marketing. 
shouldn't you be keeping track of how many people I talk to and what happens instead of me having to do it? I'm the one providing the service. And I didn't learn until later that I had to keep track of everybody and everything I was doing um, or because they would not do it. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm not casting aspersions at them. It was just, I had to learn how to do it. So basically I did that off and on for about 10 years and I would take a break every once in a while because I just felt completely overwhelmed or demoralized by it because after 10 years, I just said, look, I've got the confidence that I know whatever you tell me, whatever background you come from, the problem is the same. Mm -hmm. The type of business may vary. You could be a lawyer, you could be a baker, you could be a janitor, custodian, you could have any kind of business, but the problem is always the same. You're not getting enough customers. You think that your problem is unique. Well, you don't know my problem. My problem is different from Bob's or Susie's or, you know, and it never is. It's always the same. They're not getting the results that they want. Mm -hmm. If you get dig down deep, they know why they're not getting the results they want. So why aren't you doing anything about it? It's really that simple, (laughs) you know? I mean, I can look at most small business owners and I can look at their websites and like, you're not number one in Google locally. Do you care? And they'll tell you, maybe I do, maybe I don't. Why would you pay for a website when I can get one for free? On and on and on. Excuses. And if you throw the excuses away, you've got nobody to blame but the person in the mirror. And that's real. And it's hard and it's brutal. And I look at the mirror and I say, you know what? I never became Donald Trump. I never became Tony Stark. I, you know, and it's, it's a bitter reality because who doesn't want to be that? Mm-hmm. But I could say, but I took care of my wife. We're, we're comfortable. I don't have to go and work if I don't want to. I don't have to go kiss somebody's patootie if I don't want to. <laughs> You know what I mean? So yeah. that's what I tell myself. When my wife got cancer, I was able to take care of her. We didn't have to sell the house. We didn't have to sell the car. We didn't have to go beg in the street. That's to me, I have to pat myself on the back and say, that's good enough for now. But the reality is, yeah, I would love to say, Hey, I've got all these conferences and I'm Donald Trump and I'm big shot and, and all of this. And people who say they are, I'm often very suspicious. Mm-hmm. Because if you look a little deeper, you realize, well, how much debt are they carrying? Mm-hmm. How far away are they from bankruptcy? How long did it take them? What are they not telling you about that? So you have to kind of take it with a grain of salt. Do you really want to be that? Mm-hmm. What do you want to trade to get to that point? But um, I don't know if that's answering your question, though. Did I, did I digress too much, Kyle? No, that's fine. It's, uh, I love the stories. <laughs> but really- um it's really a lot of fun to hear all this. That's why I put this podcast together. Well, I appreciate it. And you're being kind. Um, but yeah, I, I busted my home for a long, long time. And I got the experience. And after volunteering for SCORE for so long, I reached a point where I just said, you know what? It's been 10 years, guys. Everybody is the same. Mm-hmm. And I honestly can't take it anymore. I really can't. There are people who call and email and they don't follow up. I offer to help them. They don't answer the phone. They don't respond to emails. They don't value what I'm trying to give them to help them. So why am I helping? You know, or there would be people who you feel for them. You really want to help them. There are people with nonprofits that I really wanted to help. And you couldn't. You couldn't because mm-hmm. they just wouldn't do the bare basics of what you would tell them to do. They would they'll push back. Either they resist the change or they don't believe you or they don't know you. So they don't listen or they just can't do it for whatever reason. There was a nonprofit I worked with that I saw the cause and I'm like, Oh my God, well, you know what? I can help her. I could literally transform her life if she would let me do it. And it was a woman with a nonprofit organization in Atlanta helping single mothers with um, little girls. Mm -hmm. And they were homeless, 
So I'm like, well, who can't have a heart for that, right? Yeah. I said, you, <laughs> you have know to be what? pretty cold not to care about that. <laughs> right. So I said, and, and, and this was for a nonprofit organization. So I get that you don't have a lot of money. I get that. I'll volunteer to help you. Give me a great referral. Do, you know, just do what I suggest. Let me do my magic and I'll help you. I'll make you number one in Google. I will tell you what you need to know that you can get some contracts and you can a start working with mothers and making a difference for them. And B I'll tell you how to build inroads in your community. Mm. I can't make you listen. Okay. So, <laughs> and this is the truth. So yeah. I offered to help her and I showed her the design that I had come up with based on research that Stanford university has done on digital marketing guidelines and norms and larger, more successful, more profitable competing agencies in the same city. She told me she didn't like the design. She no, wanted it no. to look like this. She wanted it to look like that. Could I change the colors? Could I have a rotating glowing logo and cartoon characters? And I said, ma'am, I can't, I can't do this. <laughs> I told you that I knew what the F I was doing. I offered to help you. I could, I could literally ignite this business overnight and make your phone ring and let you reach people. If you're going to fight me with it, I, I don't want to fight. I wanted to help you. So you, know, just, you know what? I'm sorry. I did not screen you well enough. It's my fault. I'm backing away. Hmm. And I've had this happen several times with nonprofits. So now I just say, look, if you're a nonprofit organization, organization, my heart goes out to you. I can help you. I can ignite your cause but I will not do it for free and I will not do it for super cheap bargain basement prices. You will pay me like you would anybody else or I'm not going to talk to you. I'm sorry. That's what it's become because every time I reach out my hand, it gets knocked back. So I don't do it for, I don't volunteer anymore for nonprofits. I'll talk to them. I'll work with them. I'll do a great job for them. My heart will, 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 will care for them but I'm not going to do it for free. If we talk about reduced rates, then it has to be something that's respectable. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be taken advantage of, and I don't recommend anybody else do either. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that mirrors somewhat my business as a, a ghostwriter. Uh, when somebody yeah. can't, you know, of course pay the full fee. And I understand that, that that'll happen. You know, usually I'm like, well, what else do you do? And, you know, sometimes like, well, you know, you're a digital marketer. Maybe we can trade some services for a reduced mm -hmm. rate or, you know, I'll even take mm -hmm. cover credit and a cut of the royalties for a reduced rate. Um, and one guy actually asked, you know, well, do you know anybody mm -hmm. who would be willing to invest in my book? I'm like, I, I don't have time to try and vet these people to see who would want to invest in a book, right. you know, this, that, like, right. that would be an entirely different job from what I do. Right. So, you know, it, it's always rough when that happens because, you know, you know, they really want to tell their story. It's just, you know, it's, it, it's, they obviously have a story to tell. Happen. Yeah. yeah they, they, they may not have a story to tell. They may think they do, but they don't. Yeah. And the other part is they may say they want to tell their story, but they may only mean it for fun or as a hobby or side interest, or as long as it's super cheap, mm -hmm. they don't value that sufficiently that they're willing to invest for returns on investment. Yeah. You know, there was a, there's a TV show that I like a lot called the profit. And I don't know if you've ever seen it. You have seen advertisements for it in clips. I haven't watched it. Well, also my wife and I canceled cable. So <laughs> good for you. Get yeah. a Roku. You don't need it. Mm -hmm. I did too. I have a Roku and we have Hulu, Netflix, and the great courses. Mm -hmm. I pay for the great courses. She does the other ones. And we get everything that we need on Hulu, Netflix, and then all the free channels that come on a Roku. Yeah. And then you get Pluto TV where you got a million channels. You just got to tolerate the commercials. Okay. Um, and I could tell you about that later. But anyway, <laughs> um, what was I talking about? I forgot now. The profit. The profit. Yes, excuse me. I love that TV show. And it's very educational. And there was an episode of that where the host or, you know, guy, the star of the show is a multimillionaire business owner. And he's got many, many, many different businesses that he owns. And um, there's an episode where he's talking to a lighting company. 
So they have like custom lighting. They make beautiful light fixtures. And they're at the beginning of the web of the episode, their website just sucks. It's just, it's, it's not very good. They're not making any sales from it. You can't really order the light fixtures very well from it. And the owner doesn't want to spend any money on it. So she has a cheap website. She doesn't care. She doesn't want to spend any money in it. And there's a scene in the, in the show in, the, in that episode where the host, Marcus Lemonis, the millionaire business owner, says to her, I would gladly hear this. I would gladly spend $30,000 for a great website that would generate more sales. If it's going to, if I would gladly spend 30 grand if I'm going to make back that money many times over, over the course of a year or two. And it blew her mind. The woman who was the business owner was like, what, 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 what? <laughs> you know? And he's like, yeah, that's what business owners do. Yeah. You spend $30,000 knowing you're going to make 60 in the next six months. That's called ROI, return on investment. Small business owners don't always want to do that or they can't do that or yeah. they convince themselves that they can't where they're addicted to a poverty mindset. Everything has to be super cheap or poor or, or, or the lowest possible price. And it's what I call the race to the bottom mm -hmm. where you, you go to family dollar to get your groceries, you know, where you're going to end up paying more in the long run and the food's going to stink. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember seeing somebody once at the dollar store, I went to the dollar store to, to get a water bottle and I saw somebody in line with a whole bunch of groceries. I'm like, it's a dollar for a pizza. Yes. But they're the size of your hand. Mm -hmm. So to get a, a full meal, you're going to have to buy 10 of them <laughs> and each one is going to taste like a piece of cardboard yeah. and it's going to have more sodium in it than is good for you on and on. So you think you're spending, you're saving money, but you're not saving money. You're actually spending more. So you're cutting off your nose in order to spite your face. You're throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Mm -hmm. And that's what a lot of small business owners do. And that's why the, the, the failure rate, for small businesses is something like 99.9%. .9%. Uh -huh. You know, the longer they go on, the, the greater the likelihood that they will fail within their first three to five years. If they make it beyond five years, then they have a much, much greater chance of making it. Uh -huh. Yeah. I've heard that stat a lot. <laughs> yeah. It's on my website. It's all over my website, dms.blue because I try to communicate to business owners that, this needs to be real to you. Look in the mirror and say, I need to support a family. I need to be able to pay the rent. This is real. The BS has got to stop. You stop looking at everything has to be super cheap or free. Stop looking at everything I've got to do, everything myself, or, or it's not going to be done at all. This is how you fail. Mm -hmm. smart business owners ask for help from experts when they need it. Well, how do I know it's the right person? You go to an effing expert. Mm -hmm. Okay. I hear from people every single day, all day long that they have a cheap DIY site, but they're not getting any leads from it. And they don't know why. Well, how, how did this come to be? Well, I got a free template from Wix or Weebly or Squarespace or Vistaprint for $5 a month or some other not. Well, what did you expect that you would get for nothing or for $5? That's not what real businesses do, you know? And you, I don't always say it that way, but sometimes I do. Mm -hmm. And I just say, if you want to make more money, I can show you how to do it. You don't have to be rich. You just have to be willing to budget. That's all it takes. But you have to explain these things to them because they don't know. They don't have experience with, with marketing. Mm -hmm. Would you like to be a guest on the Career Challenges podcast? Visit careerchallengespodcast.com to find out how. And while you're there, listen to all available episodes and subscribe through Spreaker, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and CastBox. More outlets are coming soon. The Career Challenges podcast is produced by me, Kyle Weckerly, and I'm a certified ghostwriter. A little bit more about that. I work almost exclusively with business authors. I've worked with authors who are coaches, consultants, mentors, speakers, some high-ticket salespeople, C-level executives, and, of course, business owners. My authors have worked for USAA, Vistage, Booz Allen Hamilton, 
Boston Technology Council, and the John Maxwell team. They want to write a book, and they want that book to help them expand their business. See, with a book in hand, they're able to market their expertise, or secure more speaking gigs, or promote their company, or all three, or maybe even more than that. They're not out to write a bestseller, though that would be nice. Instead, they have years of knowledge and experience, and sorting it out will be no easy task. More importantly, they want all that knowledge and experience to be an engaging read. To learn more about how you can become an author, visit WeckerlyWriter.com. That's W-E-C-K-E-R-L-Y-W-R-I-T-E-R.com. And schedule a consultation today. And now, back to the Career Challenges Podcast. Yeah, of course. That's a, a rampant problem. Yeah. Um, so you're you're still working with, with small businesses and solopreneurs, even after all that. I am, but I'm a lot more difficult to work with, as I'm sure you can tell. <laughs> um, you know, and I don't, I don't mean it seriously, but I, I, you know, you were asking me why am I, you know, still working with people because mm-hmm. I still love the work. I don't, you know, I, I don't love the stress of trying to convince business owners to give two Fs or to mm-hmm. care about, you know, I'm tired of trying to explain to business owners why you should care about your business, why you should want to make more money, why you should invest in order to grow or how real business is, you know, get to be number one in Google and make thousands of dollars every month. I shouldn't have to convince you to do that. So I really don't have the patience for that anymore. Whereas before I, I might have, mm-hmm. um, but I still love the work. And I love knocking it out of the park for a deserving business that wants that. Mm -hmm. That's key. Not all of them want it. You know, I remember I was talking to a woman once who had a secondhand clothing store. And my wife was in the store shopping. And we were just talking. And I said, are you selling any of your clothes on eBay or Amazon? So you can, you know, make sure that you know, your inventory actually moves more. That's what they call it in retail. You're moving inventory. And she said, no, I didn't think of that. (laughs) And I said, yeah, you you can sell on eBay now and Amazon. And, you know, if you have inventory that's not being sold after a couple of months, it's just sitting there collecting space. You want to get rid of what's not selling and bring in new inventory that is selling. And so that blew her mind. And And I said, you know, you could also have a modern website that works on modern mobile phones and you could sell your clothing online as well. And now that we think about it, you could also locally be number one at Google Mm -hmm. for clothing and everything. Would that interest you at all if you could do it? And she's like, oh, no. And I said, really? Why? She said, that'd be more work. She really did say that. And I said, and I said, come on, you're really, you're, you're asking me, right? You're, you're pulling my leg. She said, no, I don't own the store. My parents own the store. Oh. They gave me a percentage of it. I don't care if it succeeds or fails. Ooh. I don't really even, I don't even want to be here. You know, so it's like, I don't care. <laughs> so what do you do for that? I backed away very slowly. Like I just saw a train wreck because I did. And, and on a related note, I, I'll never forget. I was talking to a lawyer and I talked to him. And I won't say how or anything because I don't want to give it away. But I was talking to a lawyer and he was telling me the same thing. He had spent like five years of his life with a free DIY blank generic template Mm -hmm. website. Had no photos of himself except for one where he looked really angry like he just got his tax returns or something. (laughs) Really very very glow or sour looking photo of himself. And it was dimly Mm -hmm. lit too. So it looked like, you know, a serial killer in the photo. It almost no text or content at all. All no images, just like placeholder generic images. And it was very poorly made. No SEO, meaning if you looked up lawyer in his city, he would never come up in any search at all. And he told me he'd been spending five years tinkering with this free DIY template. And I just said, you know, why are you in a place that you just refuse to invest any money at all? You're a lawyer. I mean, you make 30, 40 grand off of every client you meet. Mm -hmm. So surely it's worth your time to invest three or $4,000 to have a professional online presence so you can be number one in Google 
Isn't that worth it to you? And he hemmed and he hawed and he complained and he saw, did a song and dance and all this. He gave me lots of excuses. And after about an hour of listening, you know, he finally came out and admitted that he was actually a partner at a much larger legacy firm oh, wow. that they, did, they didn't believe in the internet at all because they were getting all of their clients through court referrals and other larger law firms and the lawyers who were very, very active in the community. They didn't need a website. They didn't need internet marketing. They didn't care about it. They thought it was a joke. So the lawyer that I was talking to, he didn't really have a solo practice. He was thinking about it one day. Hmm. So in other words, he was kicking the can down the street. And so he really wasn't committed. He was just killing time, fiddling away with a DIY thing. So he spent five years of his life tinkering around with this DIY empty template, angry that he wasn't getting any leads. Nobody was calling him. And there was nothing he could do about it because there was nothing he was willing to do about it. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, about a month or two later, I talked to another lawyer, the same situation. She was an immigration attorney in LA, getting ready to go work at Starbucks. Hmm. And I told her point blank, I'd love to help you because I know I can do it, mm-hmm. but I can't do it for free. Yeah. And if you, if you don't want to spend any money, go work at Starbucks. Be my guest. There's, they always need another barista. Mm-hmm. And you could be a barista who blogs about immigration <laughs> law that no one ever reads. And that's yeah. what she's doing. Hmm. Yeah, you, you mentioned the, uh, the lawyer with the angry face. I noticed that on all the, the billboards here, the, the ambulance yeah. chasers here in San yeah. Antonio, they're just kind of glaring at you like, I'm, I'm a serious lawyer. It's intimidating, too. Yeah, I'm sure it's so that they they have that persona so that when they walk into the courtroom, the you know the defense or whoever is on the other side that they're they're dealing with, automatically thinks, okay, this is a a serious lawyer, you know, where he's going to be tough and he's going to work hard for his client, you know, stuff like that. But you know, I see right through that because it's like it's all yeah. marketing. You know, they want to they want to have that persona. And so, you know, it's like, I really would want to meet them and talk to them in person because I'm sure they're, they're a, a good person and decent and they have some interesting stories. I'm sure they're not right. walking around all day looking like I'm a serious lawyer. No, it's all marketing. Let me tell you, I was a mediator. Mm-hmm. So I mediated and I stopped doing it after a while. Like I said, my wife and I had a nonprofit mediation mm-hmm. uh, business that we ran for a couple years because I enjoyed mediation. I enjoyed talking to people having problems and I would walk in as a third party and I would mediate the dispute and then I would take it to a lawyer or a judge to sign off on the paperwork. That's what a mediator does. And so I had a mediation nonprofit for several years. I stopped after a while because I really did not enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Uh, The divorce proceedings were very depressing. Uh, The child custody disputes were also very, very depressing. And I didn't want to do them after a while. It wasn't worth it. Mm -hmm. And, um, but anyway, I knew a lot of lawyers. I met a lot of lawyers. I actually like lawyers. I I have a lot of respect for the intelligence that they have to cultivate and develop. Mm -hmm. And I respect the education. And I'll tell you, I gave a talk, um, at a local area law firm a couple Mm -hmm. weeks ago and it's on YouTube and, um, they were the nicest, most polite, respectful people. Very, very polite you know, offered me all kinds of food before I spoke, you know, gave me a really nice place to, to see the set. The offices were beautiful and they didn't hear a word I said. Huh. They were very nice, very polite, very respectful. I mean, just as sweet as they could be. And, and I can't say that enough. They were so nice and welcoming, but you could tell. They didn't hear a word that I was saying. And, you know, it, and, 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 and I blame myself for not putting it in more simplistic, direct terms. Mm-hmm. You know, if you watch the, 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 the video of it, there was a lawyer sitting next to me. He was very nice and sweet, very intelligent, very articulate lady. I have the utmost respect for her. She's sitting on one side of me 
And she's saying how this company did a website for her. They built a website for her law practice. And it had no SEO at all, had no social marketing at all. She had to learn how to do it all herself and all that. But she loves them. Mm -hmm. She loves them. She cannot be more effusive about them and recommending them. And I'm sitting there and listening and I'm thinking, why in the world would you say that when they made you do all this stuff yourself that they did not provide to you that they should have? Mm -hmm. That's not professional. Yeah. And then the other lady on my other side was saying how she doesn't even use digital marketing at all. She just goes to networking things and meets people the old fashioned way. And I'm sitting there listening to this gritting my teeth and I'm thinking, well, they're both really smart, intelligent, articulate people. And they're both as polite as they could be. But one lady is saying that she's singing the praises of this company that really left her hanging. And then another woman who says, I don't use it. Mm -hmm. And you're both, in my eyes, you're sitting there both leaving money on the table. Mm -hmm. Because imagine if you were number one in Google for a law firm in that city and state, what that could do for you. Yeah. But I can't make you care. It's true. True. And it's like that with, uh, with ghostwriting, with some of the authors that I've spoken with, one, one guy, really great guy. I really enjoyed talking with him. Um, you know, we talked story and his personal history and why he wanted to write the book, but he went with a, a distributor who went under. And so mm -hmm. the book is on Amazon, but he can't get any royalties off of it. He can't even pull it down. That book is up there forever. And who knows where that money's going uh, whenever somebody buys that title. And so he wanted to write another edition. So I'm like, that's great. But this time you want to be the publisher of record. That way you don't, you know, no kidding. Get, yeah. get the short end of the stick here. And so it, it was a really interesting uh, conversation. And um, is he willing to do that? He is willing to do that. Yes. Um, okay. It's something that he's actively pursuing. And so I'm like, great, go buddy, go. And, you know, even if they don't want to, even if they don't end up working with you, like you still have that, you know, I guess teacher or that spectator mentality where you're like, go dude, do it. You can do it. And you know, you get real excited about that. And so anyway, but the, um, mm. when I was I'm doing listening. my certification course and, you know, reading up and, you know, I've got to stay current on all these publishing trends and it's like, it's still happening with all the information that's out there on the internet for the self publishing firms. And some of them are not reputable. Some of them will just take your money and run. Yes. Like, you know, you guys, it's, it's sitting right there. You can, you can hear it, you can read it and you could save yourself so much time and frustration. But they don't. Really importantly money. And they don't. Yeah, you're right. They don't. They don't do it and they don't want to do it because the lure of easy money, if you look at that, what was that song from um, the Eagles or Glenn Fry or something? The Lure of Easy Money. Mm -hmm. There's some song that he did, Smuggler's Blues, I think it is. <laughs> but, you know, they can't resist the lure of easy money, the lure of something for nothing. But there are no shortcuts in life, podcast listeners out there. <laughs> there, are, there are no shortcuts in life, seriously. And they just aren't. You're not going to get married to someone who is cold and apathetic or plays games. You're not going to get married to somebody who doesn't care about you that you're not willing to spend the time to get to know or talk to. You know, I know people who are very nice people who socially are still like 20 year olds. They're dating, they're looking for hookups and they're in their fifties and sixties now. Oh man. You know, but they're still looking for hookups at the bars and they just can't, they, 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 never, they never grew up. Mm -hmm. And it's that way with small business owners, new business owners, startups. They don't know. They either don't know or they don't care or they don't believe you because they don't know you well enough that, you know, you can't go get a free DIY template and be number one in Google and get a lot of customers that way. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. I could go down the reasons why it doesn't work. But just, there's no shortcuts. If you want to have a book and you're not a writer or an author or you're a writer like me and you're just kind of lazy or you don't you have a lot of self-doubt or you're disorganized and you could use some help, mm -hmm. you have to work with somebody who knows what the F they're doing and is professional. Because I can tell you, if you go to Fiverr or Help Yours Work or whatever and you pay somebody to do it, guess what? You're going to have to do it again and again and again and again yeah. because 
They don't know what they're doing. Uh, half of them are going to have broken English or just give you some other mess just so they can get that quick payday and then you're going to disappear. Yeah. You know, and you're going to have to keep repeating it over and over again. I tried getting logos done for clients. Uh, as a web developer, I tried going to Fiverr and everything to get logos done. And I remember there was one guy who did a logo for me. I sent it back. I said, I can't use this. It's garbage. And uh, so I sent it back. And he redid it like three times. And after like three times, I just said, you know what? I'm exhausted. Keep the effing money. It's not worth it anymore. I'll go to somebody else. Mm -hmm. I went to somebody else who had the same problem. He couldn't understand English fluidly. Um, not a native speaker. So we had difficulty communicating what I was trying to find in, in the logo design. Mm -hmm. And I'm very well aware of the science behind digital marketing. You want a logo that communicates a subliminal message. You know, if it's food, you want the logo to look like the food that you're serving. If you're an investor, you want your logo to look like money, you know? So, you know, there's a, there's a celebrity um, a realtor. I think he was on a, a show, um, million was it New York Million Dollar Real Estate yeah, or something? Million Dollar like. Listing or something? Yeah, like yeah, yeah. Yeah, he see, yeah, he seemed like a really nice guy. Uh, he's really big on social media. I can't remember his name. It's like white hair. He, I, I can't. Like I said, yeah, I, I canceled my cable. So <laughs> yeah, I don't blame you. And he seems like a nice, a nice enough person. So I looked at his website and I noticed. His logo looks like a dollar sign or like money. The font that he uses is the same font that they use for the dollar bill. Mm -hmm. So it's obvious that there's a subliminal message he's trying to communicate. So real digital marketing, real marketing for that matter, that hits on all cylinders, uses a science of, you know, the psychological sciences that have been developed over the course of the last 50 years or so. And you can't just walk in off the street and say, you know, my DIY, you know, coloring book website is going to be as good as yours. It's going to reach as many people. It's going to make as much money. I'm sorry. It won't mm -hmm. because you don't, you might be a really nice, great person, but you run your business, whether it's an optician or a restaurant or a law firm or a dentist or whatever, their job is to run that business and then work with a professional who has that area of expertise. I wouldn't go to a ghostwriter and ask you to make me the best pizza ever. Well, actually I do. I do make a good pizza. Like I do have a right. nice homemade recipe that I, I, I've got a bread maker. I can make the dough right. and I can make the pizza. So, I mean, if you wanted a really but great, you get pizza, the point. What? But you get the point. Yeah, I get the point. You're right. I was just right. messing with you. <laughs> right. And my wife makes a really good pizza souffle. That's what I call it. Pizza souffle. I like the Chicago style. And so mm -hmm. she'll make it like a foot thick. And it's like, holy, you know, this is incredible. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, but yeah, that's, you know, it's like that old saying, you know, the master of, you know, jack of all trades, master. master of none. Yeah. You know, I'm good at a lot of things. I'm not a master of everything. True. You know, right. So even though, even with my amazing homemade recipe, I still would not open a restaurant and sell pizzas. I would go to Gordon Ramsay first mm -hmm. and study with him or whoever, you know, the best chef is that you can go and study with to learn how to be better at it. Mm -hmm. So if you're a serious business owner, you can try DIY and do everything like that. You know, I remember going to my dentist a while ago and I had to have a um, dental work done and I, and he was a really, really nice young guy. He was just out of dental school and he was really buff and he looked like he could bench press Peoria and he was a really <laughs> nice guy. And so we were talking and everything. And I said, Hey man, just out of curiosity, do you get people coming in here, you know, trying to do their own dentistry and everything? Cause I see these kits on Amazon and he said, Oh yeah. He said, believe it or not. Yeah. He said, I had one lady in here who didn't want to pay for a root canal. So he said she took, you know, paper clips and butterfly clips and, uh -huh. and pins and stuff. And he said, and she did it like that for like a couple of days. And then she started getting all these horrible infections and yeah. we had to remove everything and redo it. And it was a horrible mess and it was really quite gory. And he said, and I ended up having to charge her like, you know, 30 grand to redo everything. Yeah. And I had to do surgery on her. So he said she ended up spending quadruple what she wanted to because she was trying to cut corners with something that was very important. 
So for business owners, I just say, is this important to you? Or it is just a, you know, a BS hobby that if it never makes any money, you're okay with that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Some people would tell you it's just a hobby I do for, for fun. Mm-hmm. If it doesn't make any money, I'm okay with that. And that's fine for them. Mm-hmm. It's not fine for me. Yeah. Cause uh, what's that saying that the cheapest one is the one you really pay for. Yeah. And um, there was an old story that, um, you know, I remember the, the great salesman Zig Ziglar, if anybody remembers that name, mm-hmm. um, the great, great salesman, I remember seeing him at some seminar or something, and he told the story how he was a little boy, and his parents were not very wealthy, and he wanted a bicycle. So his parents went and they bought him a bicycle at the local five and dime store. And he was a little boy, and he would ride the bicycle all the time because he loved it. And after a couple of months, the bicycle blew a flat tire. They had to go replace it. That was like, you know, whatever the fee was at that time. Mm -hmm. And then, then the handlebar came loose. They had to fix the handlebar. And then another six months later, the back tire got broken. He hit a bump or something and the axle broke on and on. And basically after like three or four years, they had paid for the bicycle several times over in repairs. And finally, one day after several years, his father said, throw it away. We'll go to Schwinn and we'll pay several hundred dollars Mm -hmm. for a brand new top of the line bicycle. But he's, but Zig Ziglar said, it lasted me the rest of my life. I still have it today. And I gave it to my son. He's going to give it to his son. All we have to do is oil it. Wow. So they saved hundreds, if not thousands of dollars over the course of three generations by just (laughs) investing for profits one time. Mm -hmm. So now I don't get pizza from the dollar store. I don't. (laughs) You can, you know, you can come over and we'll try it once, but I, I don't do that. I go to my favorite pizza joint in the area or I make it or my wife makes it or we go someplace nice because I actually like pizza. Mm-hmm. Matters to me. And if your business matters to you and you want to take care of a family and grow it one day, then you have to say, look, I'm not willing to cut corners and, and give my customers the cheapest crap on the planet. You know, mm-hmm. I, I'm not willing to roll the dice and take chances. This is real to me. And, and, and I'm not saying that to you, Kyle. I'm saying that to anybody listening. Yeah. Sorry, I was writing down a note. Oh, that's fine. What was the note? Kill David. <laughs> no, I'm writing show notes. Actually, it helps with my editing process. Okay. When I go to edit, edit out that part. Yeah, I'm going to edit this part out where I'm explaining that I edit this part out. Anyway, so <laughs> okay. uh, that's great. So, uh, David, what's what's next for you? What's what's going on with you? Well. Um, you know, basically, I, I love being on podcasts. I, I love talking turkey, and I love answering questions that, you know, just kind of being a cipher and just, you know, people asking me whatever they want to know about digital marketing. So I try to be an informational resource for people about this topic because it can, be, it can get really, really complicated where people really obsess over uh, tools rather than objectives and really achieving specific results. So I love being on podcasts. And if you hear that little ding, ding tune in the background, my apologies, that means there's websites being backed up. Wow. So, and that's automated. There's another one. And it just told me a law firm website just got backed up. So I, all of my clients, I back up their sites on a daily basis at different times. So I don't exhaust the servers. So that's what that sound is. Um, but, you know, I, I love being an informational resource for people about digital marketing. Um, I speak at professional associations and organizations and conferences whenever I get the opportunity. Because, again, it's just a great way to get, um, you know, accurate information out to people who might not otherwise get it. Mm-hmm. Like what you were saying with ghostwriting, you know, so many people get misinformation from people who just want to make a quick buck they don't really know what's accurate and what's not. Um, So the more you get yourself out there, the more good you're doing in the long term. And some of these people might want to actually invest 
so that they can make more money in the long run as well. You know, I went to go see a doctor the other day um, and I was asking the doctor about um, something and he was telling me how people come in to, to see the doctor and they see, well, they say to him, you know, I saw this on Dr. Oz and he has to tell them, look, the man's, you know, got other motives other than helping you. He can't diagnose your problems. He doesn't know you. Mm -hmm. He's not running tests on you. He's not asking you about your personal objectives or your goals in life. He can't know what's wrong with you. So whatever he tells you is general. It doesn't apply to you. Mm -hmm. So just because you heard it on Dr. Oz or you saw his article about it doesn't mean it pertains to you. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's that way with service providers in general. So I try to get out there as much as humanly possible and get out of my shell. Because I'm actually very, very introverted, um, however I may sound. Yeah, as am I. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm quite difficult to to talk to. I think. <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. It was it was a great uh, recording. Um, a lot of great stories, and that's what I love about this is we get to swap stories. It's always fun. Do, do you have questions for me? Because I feel like I'm rambling too much. No, no, that's great. Uh, whatever questions I asked you are on your podcast, which is what, what's your podcast, by the way, for for those who are interested. Oh, I don't know. I can't remember. <laughs> no, I, I, it's my my business website is DMS Blue. This is a real website. I know it's an uncommon domain name, but. My initials are DMS. I'm a digital marketing specialist and my favorite color is blue. And I've got, you know, all the blue suits and the blue glasses. So it's DMS.blue. Mm -hmm. And um, you can email me at DMS at DMS.blue. You can call me at 424-DAVID-01. And you can be on my podcast at DMS.blue slash podcast. Yeah. The Business my, Blues podcast, right? That's what and my, no, my podcast is called Blue Monday. Oh, Blue Monday. That's right. Blue Monday. Yeah. Because that's an expression of people dreading going to work on Monday. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't have any idea what that's like. <laughs> oh, we all do. I think yeah. everybody does. Yeah. You know, and that's, that's another reason why, you know, while I worked for all these agencies, I wanted to always go off and try to work on my own until I could finally do it more full time on a permanent basis because I would always go to these agencies and you would see all the things that they were doing or the clients they were losing or the people would just say, I've had it and they'd get up and quit on the spot, you know, and, or you would see all these things that, you know, you knew you could do better mm -hmm. or could do differently or more ethically. Um, and, and, and that was the motivator for me, but that's what blue Monday is. Everybody has gone to jobs or they're still doing it you know, going to jobs that are, are slowly killing them. Mm -hmm. You know, I read somewhere that the heart attack rate for people going to work on Monday is the highest of any other day of the week. Oh, wow. More people have heart attacks on Monday than any other day of the week because their hearts are telling them, I don't want to go back to this. Didn't I tell you? Mm -hmm. And you're making me go anyway. <laughs> True. True. All right. Well, David Summerfleck, thank you so much for being uh, on the Career Challenges podcast. Well, you're more than welcome. How can people listen to this great podcast, Kyle? Well, of course, you know, they find it on Apple Podcasts, <laughs> Stitcher, CastBox, Spotify, uh, Spreaker. You can also find it on my website, uh, thecareerchallengespodcast.com or weckerlywriter.com. And that information is also in the, uh, the outro that I'm going to play here in a little bit. Okay. Well, I had a lot of fun being on your podcast and I hope uh, what I could provide was helpful to uh, some business owners and listeners out there. All right. I'm sure it was. <laughs>